it's a little bit like sales actually but the first part is you build a crappy prototype like this could be presentation this could be uh, mock-ups this could be something half-assed that depends a little bit on the situation but it's usually not something that works completely and it's definitely not something that is in a good state when we talk about technology and software engineers Welcome to the Hyper Engage podcast. We are so happy to have you along our journey. Here, we uncover bits of knowledge from some of the greatest minds in tech. We unearth the hows, whys, and whats that drive the tech of today. Welcome to the movement. Hey, greetings, everybody. This is Adil from Hyper Engage podcast. I have my co-host, Taylor Kennison, uh, a very unique slightly uh, different uh, product and the guests we have. We are now rolling in more CTOs because these technical conversations go way beyond than any other conversation. So we're going to be talking about tech stack, uh, you know, associated with uh, our guests, their product, their technical teams, how they are scaling operations, where they're sitting at uh, as, as a business uh, in a B2B space. So uh, thank you very much, Oli, for joining. Oli is a CTO uh, and, and co-founder at Bring Data. It is a B2B revenue attribution platform, more for the revenue teams, more for the data, uh, you know, centric teams that are basically investing so much into revenue ops, uh, data, like revenue ops, data integrations, all of these. So we'll learn more about uh, what 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 Oli is doing at Dream, uh, Dream Data. Thank you very much, Oli, one more time for, for taking uh, this uh, on your schedule. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the talk. Woo. Let's dive into it, Ali. Before we bring it to the current moment, um, how you started is really unique. So I would love to take it back a little bit. And what inspired you to join the team at Trustpilot after you advised Apogee, now a Google company? I mean, you started as I believe it was employee number 10, or you were one of the very few that were a part of the company. So what even inspired you to get involved in a startup at such an early stage? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it was humans. Uh, so um, at this time, uh, the story was that uh, one of my friends, a uh, very good friend I studied with, uh, worked with, he joined Trustpilot and he knew I was looking for something else. And he said, hey, I think you should come over here and talk uh, with the founder, that's Peter. Uh, and I think this is interesting for you. And I was like, ah, no, I think I need to join these kind of enterprises and make some real money. Um, and then uh, I went over and had a sandwich with Peter and um, went back uh, and resigned and started. Uh, and I said to my uh, girlfriend at that time, but wife now, that, hey, I think I know what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I'm going to do startups. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think that it's people. It's humans. There's a very different type of people in startups than what we see in enterprise. Yes, absolutely. You know, that, I mean, that makes it, that's, that's going to make it so real. When you're so connected with people that you've, you've, you've known long enough, and, uh, you know, it's not just about, uh, idea. It's not just about the vision. It's it's about people and your connection with those uh, with those people. And we we get to hear a lot of these stories from uh, startups that they have they have this strong bond with the founding teams, or they have collapsed uh, when when it comes to relationship. And everything got like even at a point when they shut down. There are so many platforms that just got shut down uh, uh, just off of this reason that they were not so much you know look alike. So it, it depends a lot what kind of people you choose to work with. For sure. It's super important. Absolutely. So, I mean, I'm so interested to know, uh, Oli, your background at, let's say, Trustpilot, it's as a VP and then, you know, VP of engineering, you turned out to uh, as a CTO. How do you see it as different? Uh, of course, CTO is just like not a business owner, but you are still taking all the high level decisions on the technical side. That's fine. But how do you see it different? Uh, than building a, your own product, co-founding a product such as Ring Data. How did that transition uh, take into place? So I was very early employee at uh, Trustpilot. So, so uh, I had some of the co-founder uh, pains as well. But I think the, the main difference is that uh, when uh, we miss sales targets uh, uh, at Trustpilot, I didn't sleep bad. 
uh, now that is kind of hurting a little bit more uh, and kind of something that has to kind of hit as well. Um, I think also that was the journey I took through Trustpilot. I went from being uh, the, the technical maybe leader and more moving into actually being the a business uh, leader and taking responsibility and maybe my expertise is uh, uh, technology and product but but i think mm, i see it more as i'm a technology leader that is responsible for driving revenue with with technology and product um so so i mm. do kind of take uh, revenue responsibility um yeah, and at least uh, if not everyone at uh, Trustpilot would maybe recognize that, but at least uh, I'm pretty confirmed that everyone at Dream Day, they will recognize that. Mm. Yes, yes, because you spent like seven long years there. And uh, as you mentioned that you were, uh, since making all the high-level technical decisions, but you're closer to driving sales because uh, in a B2B space in this day and age, it's your product. You Your product has to be bigger than your marketing. Yeah, so so you can not, exactly. And it's not like I'm driving sales. I don't think uh, it, that's kind of what I do either here or before, but but it's more that I take responsibility of uh, making revenue. So for example, we uh, talk with customers uh, and prospects all the time in tech and product to understand them. So we make sure we build valuable products. We measure and understand that what are features used uh, which features can be charged for, uh, which features are valuable uh, at kind of multiple level, uh, talk with sales. Um, of course, I would also help kind of close a deal uh, and have be part of the sales conversation, but it's not so much that part I'm talking about. It's more mm -hmm. kind of taking the responsibility of making sure that our product is valuable um, and sellable. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very interesting. And talking about like, in the early days, back in 2018, when you started with Dream Data, I'm sure uh, you know a lot of these founders, like many of them, since you are been been there as CTO as trust partner for seven years, not that hard of a thing. But a lot of these co-founders, they are so much overwhelmed with so many things that they don't know. So, what kind of challenges you had first off getting the foot in the door when you started back in 2018 in terms of getting, of course, on the marketing side, there was a different challenge. What kind of market you need to tap in that you already might know, but how to position the product, uh, how to finalize the product features, like what was your process? Like you made a minimum viable product, hand it over to some of the folks that you knew at, uh, you know, at Trustpilot, your past relationship. How did that uh, workflow in the beginning start? Because a lot of these startups would get a huge help. Yeah. So um, I think it's the hard part is, is figuring out what is valuable. And so it's very easy to come up with a lot of features that sounds uh, awesome. And it's very easy to convince yourself that these are amazing. Uh, some of them might be uh, more likely. Most of them are not. Um, this is a guy called Marty Kagan uh, uh, that kind of learned us that. Uh, Marty Kagan is uh, the guy who also learned Google and uh, eBay, uh, these kind of things, amongst others. Uh, but... Um, so it's figuring that out. And so then how do you figure that out? Well, you um, it's a little bit like sales actually, but um, but the first part is you build a crappy prototype. Like this could be presentation, this could be uh, mock-ups, this could be something half-assed that works a little bit, uh, that depends a little bit on the situation, uh, but but it's usually not something that works completely. And it's definitely not something that is in a good state when we talk about technology and software engineers. Um, and then you go knocking on people's doors. Hey, do you want to talk a little bit with me? Do you have this type of problem? Uh, try to talk to me about like how you're solving this problem today. Would you like to solve this problem? How big a pain is it? Hey, I have this prototype. I would like to show you if you had that. Would that help you, right? Uh, and probably some of the first prototypes you show, then people will say, yeah, mm -mm, not really, right? <laughs> and then hopefully at some point you have a prototype where people start saying, yes, that seems like something. And then you start saying, well, if I built this, would you pay for it? And that's the real important question, 
right? And if they say yes, then you would kind of want to commit them. So what if we do, a, could be a non-legal binding letter, but an intent to buy uh, for some amount, let's say $10,000, right? And then if they're, ah, ah that, that's not how I meant it. Well, that's an indication that you just try to be friendly. Uh, that's of course good, but not what you're looking for, right? You're looking for those people who are actually willing to commit. Um, mm. And do you do that? And when you start finding a few customers that has some of the same problems that you can solve without having to build too much, that's where you start having something you can go out and build. And I and think that's, yeah, sorry. That's a really interesting um, point that you brought up. I feel like so many uh, founders, especially in the early days, they're looking for that hack or that tip. And it seems like through every single conversation, so many just start off the same way. It's iterating, it's putting something together in its most basic form and just getting it out there. And the more reps you get through those conversations and the more feedback, then you begin to refine what you have. And it's usually never the the initial thing you go out to, you know, the people you're getting feedback is never really the thing that you actually wind up building. Um, so that's a really interesting and important nugget for all founders out there looking to create their own thing to recognize that there is really no easy way. And it is this nitty gritty, messy mm -hmm. middle and interesting, you know, journey and initiation. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Um, yeah. And then the other side of things is the more strategic uh, and kind of things that at least some investors would care about is that you build like one thing is you start building something you can sell now right that's what i'm talking about and that's important to start getting feedback and start building up revenue and customers but you need to also have a long-term vision where you're moving how you're going to do that uh, and that's kind of where stra like strategy technology and also the the market plays in uh, and this is why it's important that it's actually the CTO that does this. Uh, it doesn't have to be the only person involved, of course, but the CTO has to be super central to this because you have to understand what, what are we trying to achieve for who, uh, both short term, like very micro short term, and then long term, uh, right? Even though we don't know where we're heading long term, and in the early years, this changes uh, daily almost, right? Uh, but later, uh, you have to build that up. That's your kind of job to make sure you will build the technology to be ready at the right time. Um, and particularly mm -hmm. as early stage, we are we can't build too much. So we can't over-engineer. Um, I think many most engineers at least have a period in their life where they uh, end up over-engineering. Um, that's bad in this stage. It is, it is. Because as you mentioned that having a clear roadmap, you may have pivots on weekly basis, monthly basis, that's fine. But you need to set down a direction of your product, where you're heading. As soon as you get your first initial customers, you need to make sure, okay, these are our, our customers that we need to build these kind of features. Most probably on a very high level, this is the direction we're going to be taking. And uh, a lot of these, in, only in this year, a lot of pivots, big platforms are made pivots due to the AI. That is, I would say, once in a decade kind of, uh, you know, transition that, you know, tech space has in my lifetime of 28, nine years, it is the biggest transition that we face. But again, uh, as a CTO, building a product, having a domain knowledge, you can definitely have a ballpark high level roadmap of your product, uh, you know, for ever since you get like the customers, initial customers. What do you think about this? So, so definitely. Uh, so you have to think ahead. Uh, I, I think. Um... Uh, and, and try to solve the right to I mean it, it's the hard part I find that most new kind of people who move into this what I see they often find very hard is this you have to deliver now while you build up infrastructure for the future uh, and mm -hmm. you have to kind of balance this out all the time yes. Uh, yes. and as the CTO you're responsible for both and you are mm -hmm. accountable for both at the same time, but no one will praise you for building infrastructure today for the future, uh, mm. right? Uh, but you have to do that. Um, mm. 
right? And if you get, I maybe uh, at least uh, many of the listeners will probably have experienced that, uh, hey, we I work in a startup and there's a lot of technical depth. Well, that's a sign that this balance wasn't correct, right? Mm. It's not like we will, we all have technical depth. So, so like that happens, uh, but you have to balance this out constantly. And that's hard. That's, I, it, it's painful, uh, mm. uh, but you have to do this. Absolutely. I mean, I cannot tell you how bad I wanted to hear this and I wanted to discuss it because we are also a B2B tech stealth mode startup. I have a seat here that was talking to me last night that there's something that we can, we may overlook right now, but it's going to be a bigger problem years later. So we need to, uh, we need to either ship it now versus we need to just wait on, build it, a scalable model on the data side, data engineering side, pipeline, data pipeline. We also a, a data analytics platform uh, going to launch in a few weeks. So, I mean, I, I absolutely echo with this uh, because, uh, you know, I'm not an engineer, but I have seen him, uh, you know, banging his head around, uh, around these kind of problems that are, you know, creating some complications in the beginning that may, right. uh, you know, in and, the foreseeable and, future. On the other side, you have to also kind of pull back as an engineer. Most of us like to uh, have this clean architecture, and yeah. uh, uh, but you have to move fast here. So it, like speed is everything. Uh, uh, and I, I, uh, I actually like, uh, like Facebook's old uh, move fast to break things. So uh, at this stage, this is super, super important. Like it's okay to break things. And it's very, very, so one of the things I actually had to do this at Trustpilot a few times where uh, we were shipping fast and probably breaking things. Uh, and then uh, sales got upset, right? And I had to stand a little bit in the middle here and say, hey, no, like, because we can't beat up the engineers for that because then they can't move fast, right? Mm. Of course, we have to respect the customers and the sales process and so on. So we have to find a, a, a ground for, for them to work as well. But we can't beat up engineers for this. And this happens in more startups than I like is that, and then they get scared, right? And then they test, they over-engineer, they over-test, they suggest to hire uh, uh, Q, more QAs instead of actually hiring software engineers. Mm. And then you end up not delivering uh, value. Mm. Yes. It, it's but, also such a delicate balance too of, you know, as a startup and definitely, you know, launching something for the first time that you have to ship fast, but then it's also the mentality of you want it to be just good enough, but then sometimes you get caught up in that just good enough is perfect. And then you're too deep in the trenches and you're trying to pull back. So what would be your advice, Ali, to, you know, people going off on their own journey, starting a company on how to balance that, how to manage those priorities and those, you know, different tasks that you know need to get done, but when is the question? Um, hmm. uh, it, this is hard, and so it is. Um, but you need to be a little bit into the dirt. Uh, you need to very be very clear on where's the value lies. Um, so what is the valuable piece of this feature we are delivering? And then you need to have a focus within the team of software engineers, product managers, designers, that you always ship the value first. Like always get the value out and be okay that there's a little bit of shaky technology behind it, but get the value out. This enables us to show that we move fast to customers. This is exceptionally important early stage. But it also enables us to prove that it's valuable. Very mm. often we have these ideas and we have some proof, uh, right? But we need to prove it's valuable. What if it's not? And that happens. And this happens definitely for me. We ship something, it's not valuable. Well, if we wasted as little time as possible, killing it is not as painful. But if we did all the work to make it a perfect feature and it's just then killing it is very, very painful, right? And we can't do that. So we need to get that value out and get that feedback. Early stage, we also have that luck, that scale. It's actually not a problem, right? Because we don't have scale. 
we have few customers, uh, maybe no customers yes. even, right? Uh, so scale is a problem for later, but we can still architecture our setup so that we can maybe decouple certain services and so, so that, okay, we have something over here. We know that doesn't scale, but we'll handhold it for the first few customers until we prove it's valuable. And then we'll readdress this problem. Uh, sometimes we'll be outspoken about it. So we'll tell the entire team saying, hey, we can get three customers on this. When we hit three, we have to go back and uh, then we can't sell this anymore, right? Uh, yes. So I've done that many times. So that's one way. Um, yes. Uh, sometimes you just know you can, at Trustpilot, I had the rule that if this is... Uh, not a bigger problem, then I can uh, just not sleep for a couple of days. Then that's kind of <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, so we did that uh, for a while. Um, yeah. Mm, yeah we, we're Whatever. doing it. Sorry. We are doing it for 30 customers, for 30 beta users. So then we'll have to do some, uh, you know, on the back end adjustments, on the data pipelines, all of that. This is what I got from the CTO. And which I think, which I, you, you, you also very good it, that it's, it's it's the right decision right now. That, that, that's uh, a good way of often doing it, uh, right? You get some real data in. You you get mm -hmm. to see if you are on the right track. Uh, you get some feedback from customers. While thirty is, uh, I assume, not a larger amount, and you can actually manage it uh, by hand. Maybe there's yes. some processes. An engineer every morning gets up and press a button or whatever yes. uh, to sync mm -hmm. a job. That's <laughs> fine, right? Yeah, absolutely. So now we have like uh, pretty much up on time, like five, six more minutes. So if you have a hard stop, do let us, let us know. We can squeeze another five minutes since we're going to be talking about dream data, your post sign up journey. I see you have a premium plan. I'm sure you're driving your tech stack more heavily towards, you know, converting these free to, you know, the pro plan and then teams plan, uh, sorry, business plan and enterprise. So how does the tech stack look like at dream data? Uh, while well, you're someone that has made a high level decision on incorporating the uh, the technologies for the post sign up, and uh, you know how you're ensuring the success of these accounts, these paid accounts once they're converted uh, to paid account. Like, how does the onboarding look like? Just give us a brief on that, a bit on the technology. So once you mention technology, our audience and even ourselves will know. Okay, this is how they're leveraging, let's say, this technology to ensure these kind of use cases uh, around customer success or post sales journey. All of that. So, so uh, we are very much about data. So the Dream Data is a is a, an attribution platform, but we generally go to market analytics platform for B two B companies. So we'll we gather a lot of data uh, about the customer's journey, and so we use that actually a lot uh, ourselves to onboard customers, to uh, do analytics, to target customers, uh, and so on. Um, so, but when we talk about onboarding, we get people in as a self-service sign-up, and then we start communicating to them in various ways. Uh, so we uh, we send out emails to educate them about the product. We try to uh, motivate them to uh, onboard themselves. Uh, so that's kind of the, you could say the product, uh, and we'll continue doing that uh, like in various ways, depending on how they act um, uh, within the product. While we do that, we also kind of send the, the signups to sales. And sales are able to look at them and classify them. Um, today, we do that mostly manually, but I think in a very clear in near future, we'll kind of uh, use the large language models uh, to look up uh, different information about these companies. Uh, we have also a lot of enrichment data from our own product. Uh, come in and then kind of use that to make sure they uh, they do that well or maybe even automate that uh, part of the process and then sales might start reaching out to them um, they might also wait until uh, the customer uh, says hey i want to like to upgrade or uh, in, until they onboard a little bit more and then sales start having conversation with them uh, in a I think relatively straightforward, normal uh, process. So that's mm -hmm. kind of how we do all the inbounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you when you talk about uh, you know economic events like uh, you know um, renewals and all of those those kind of data metrics, 
uh, and they're so much associated with the product usage of a customer. So how you're ensuring as a data company, data centric company that your team, your customer facing team, mean, you know, sales, support, whatever, is absolutely on top of the product usage, uh, product activities of the customers to ensure that they are more likely to retain, they're more likely to expand, they are going to churn. How so, does that data process? So, so our sales team use our own platform a lot. So inside our own product, you can log in and see a, a, an entire view of the customer journey up to the stage they are. Uh, so they have an understanding of that, that joins kind of activity data from website tracking, intent data, uh, and so on. So, so, cost, so kind of sales use that. Uh, custom success can also use that and might also kind of look at the data there. They're usually a little bit more interested into uh, certain feature usages um, um, of various kinds. And so we have uh, uh, similar tools for that dashboards where uh, customer success can go in and see, hey, okay, this customer, which features are they using? Uh, how active are they? Uh, who was active from the account? Uh, and so on. So they make sure to reach out to the right people um, and also understand how they're using the product. Um, yeah. Cool, cool. So you mentioned customer success platform. What kind of platform are you using? You can absolutely name it. Uh, so, so, so it, uh, it Dream Data is built on, on BigQuery. So all the data is in BigQuery. And so we would have mm -hmm. all the analytics data always available in BigQuery. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the dashboard here was building, uh, it's called Luca Studio now. Luca, uh, okay, yes. Um, but it could be any BI tool. Uh, there are many mm -hmm. great tools out there. Uh, so that's okay. kind of where uh, we have it. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, because the product kind of delivers this, our mm -hmm. whole product delivers this out of the box. Uh, uh, within um, then it's pretty easy to map it out in a, a local studio. Yeah, yeah. You you are your own customer, so and then you're yeah. on top on top. You're building custom objects using Looker and all these integrations. That's cool. So now uh, one last thing, like looking at your customers, how many customers do you have on a recurring like annual recurring basis? I'm not talking about customers, just users. How many users do you have annually that you guys serve? What kind of uh, you know, let's say data metrics or data points that you are serving per month uh, around these kind of things. So I'm just trying to see how you so, guys are operating so, at scale. So we have B2B, so so we have uh, 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 around a thousand customers um, now, um, and it will vary how many users are in there. Uh, Per, per customers, uh, some have uh, hundred uh, in per month, and some have uh, a few. Uh, so that kind of varies a little bit uh, on size of business, and so um, uh, the volume kind of we go through. I think the volume is is mostly kind of data volumes and how much we process. Um, yes. So we process many kind of million tracking events. Uh, so we have a tracking component. Um, Got it. Um, it's probably a few million uh, every day. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, so that's kind of uh, data we get okay. in, some data from your CM and so on. Um, mm -hmm. so, so scale today and those kind of things has become easy. Uh, mm -hmm. This is some of the things that where technology changed a lot. So when I mm -hmm. uh, started uh, like the startup world, then building what we built here would have been hard. I would say almost impossible if you were not a huge, huge mm -hmm. corporation like Google or something. Yes. Today, this is easier, accessible and scalable and something you can build uh, at least with the right engineering mindset and scale is very, very... You're saying this, you're saying this because of uh, generative AI? No, 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 no. Uh, so this is more about scaling data volumes. So mm -hmm. like when I started, uh, I mean, now I'm old maybe, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, when I started here, like out to scaling of services, uh, uh, load balancing was available, but not a press on a button. Today, you mm -hmm. just like scale to any load of CPUs, uh, with press on a button, right? Um, that's also what is happening with 
uh, AI today, right? So, uh, and that was actually the bet we did at Green Data. So we mm. we have not, in purpose, not built too much uh, AI stuff into the product. We did mm -hmm. that because we wanted to more focus on getting data streamlined and getting data ready for doing your own data trained. You're you're looking towards your own data machine learned or trained so that you yeah. can leverage your... so, Yes, yeah, so we didn't do that uh, in mm -hmm. purpose because we saw the hard part and what we saw people struggle with was actually collecting the data and getting it into a form where they could run machine learning on top of it. Mm. Uh, so we focused on that initially, not saying that we could, like, we would necessarily continue only doing that, but we started focusing on that uh, because we believed that there would be uh, some new models coming out, uh, not necessarily that I predicted that either the time or the, uh, like, the how it looked, uh, mm -hmm. but we predicted at least advanced models would come that would solve many of these problems better than we could most likely do. Um, mm. and that's also what's happening okay. now. So the large language models uh, we see both from Google and Mark, or not Microsoft, GPT uh, or OpenAI um, are amazing, right? It's models that most of our startups would not never be able to build, even if we exactly. understood technology, yes. we couldn't yes. uh, kind of afford building it. Now they're mm. accessible, uh, so we can mm. query it directly from BigQuery. Um, it, it's amazing, right? Uh, so that means we can do very advanced stuff uh, now. And because we have the data ready, we can mm -hmm. just do it. So for example, a thing we just did the other day in a couple of hours was uh, we have titles uh, pulled out from our customers' um, CM. And now mm -hmm. we did a model that could kind of build this into roles and seniority, mm -hmm. right? Something that was potentially hard uh before or at least something that took uh, some time and today mm -hmm. this is very easy to do right uh, as in hours mm -hmm. of, uh, and so some problems are better pushed mm -hmm. to the future even though you could mm -hmm. do them today and mm -hmm. you are eager to do them today sometimes mm -hmm. it's better to push them to the future because technology mm -hmm. will solve it for you and some problems mm -hmm. you have to fix today absolutely absolutely so Oli, it was real nice uh, talking to you today and we learned a lot like since that's why I love so much having uh, people with technical background more often and uh, you know we get to learn a lot a lot of different things and uh, I really appreciate your time here today. Most welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you Ali. Love that. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you so very much for staying with us on the episode. Please share your feedback at adil at hyperengage.io. We definitely need it. Uh, we will see you next time with another guest on the stage with some concrete tips on how to operate better as a customer success leader and how you can empower engagements with some building some meaningful relationships. We qualify people for the episode just to make sure we bring the value to the listeners. Do reach us out if you want to refer any CS leader. Until next time, goodbye and have a good rest of your day.